WordCamp's class on creating sci-fi worlds and just kind of sci-fi world building workshop, we might call it. This is a stage channel, so you'll have to raise your hand and request to speak if you'd like to speak out loud. You can click that hand icon. At that point, you'll have to accept the invitation when I send it to you. And if you're watching on one of our other sites like YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, you should come join us on Discord. You can find the link to do that at scriptcamp.net. We are Word. This class is taking place on WordCamp, which is a different server, but we're all sort of centered around uh, SkillCamp, and ScriptCamp is still the name of our main website. So you can come sign up at scriptcamp.net if you'd like to get your two-week free trial of membership to absolutely every event that we do, every class, workshop, script swap, table read, writers group. We have lots of free classes and events like this one, and also we have uh, classes for supporting members too, such as boot camps, labs, and advanced classes. We have plenty of other servers that you can see here. So if you're looking on Discord for classes in things like animation, coding, languages, graphic design, or filmmaking, you should stop by these other servers. And you'll see announcements um, of upcoming classes mostly in the Script Camp server, which we're using as our sort of home base until we're able to um, expand into a Skill Camp server potentially or something along those lines. So I'm a horror thriller action screenwriter. I also write sci-fi and fantasy novels for the most part. Um, not usually ones that involve a ton of world building, but I thought that today we could look at some of these basics of how do we come up with the worlds that these sci-fi stories take place in, and how do we make sure that we're designing a world that allows us to take most advantage of the sort of technological premises for our stories. Okay, we have a question in the chat. What makes or doesn't make a world with superpowers count or not count as sci-fi? Okay, so superpowers are kind of a big crossover section where in a comic world, characters can derive powers from any number of different sources. Um, in Marvel and DC, for instance, we have people who got their powers from a magic ruby fighting alongside people who got their powers from genetic experimentation alongside people who got their powers from a radioactive blast or something like this. So the sci-fi means science fiction, of course, we know this. So that means that we're looking at plot elements that are not possible now but might be possible someday. Fantasy is stuff that is not possible now and will never be possible occasionally there's a little bleed through and crossover as things that we did not know at one point would eventually be possible we later find out are possible but for the most part that's the question we need to ask is this something that theoretically could someday at some point be possible using the scientific principles that we know about even if they're kind of stretched or expanded or they aren't particularly realistically portrayed as long as there is that veneer of explanation <coughs> of an explanation based <coughs> in scientific reality even if, of course, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly exactly accurate, but that's that's how we determine sci-fi. So some superhero characters are sci-fi based, some aren't. Iron Man has an, a sci-fi based power set. It's a suit that he built himself that uses all technologically feasible machine applications, whereas some characters like, I don't know, uh, Doctor Strange are not sci-fi based at all. So it depends on how you set up your comic world or your superhero world. Is this a world where all my characters have science-derived powers, or it could be a mix? And there's no rule saying it has to be one or the other, but that's how we determine which ones are sci-fi elements and which ones aren't, the theoretical possibility. Okay, here's the dates of the new upcoming boot camps. We're going to have a new pilot boot camp, six weeks to write a whole pilot, starting July 9th. That'll be running Sundays 10 to noon. We have 90-day novel boot camp that's going to be running Saturdays 12 to 2, starting July 22nd. You'll write a whole book in three months. And then last, we have eight-week feature boot camp. Next one starts June 30th, and that'll be running Fridays from 6 to 8 p.m. Looks like we might have a question from Jack. Go ahead. Um, For novel writing boot camp, is the boot camp going to include world building, character creation, and prep like that, or should you have the prep done before the boot camp starts? You don't have to have it done beforehand. We include that stuff. So we're kind of imagining you're coming to it with a brand new idea. You haven't done any work on it yet. So it's okay to just start from the very ground level. Start from scratch. Okay, thank you. Sure, good question. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll take other questions if people have them on the, the boot camps or any of these programs, but I'll just leave this up. This has a list of all the upcoming classes. Write a movie in eight weeks is the overview class for that feature boot camp that will sort of tell you everything to get ready for and how to prepare for the upcoming weeks. And you can also get some early feedback on your ideas. Week one is the official first starting class of that course. Um, and week zero and week one in all the boot camps are open to everybody. So you don't have to sign up for those. We hope to see you there anyway. We have more coming up like writing for young audiences, July 8th. 
We have Adapting Myths, Stories, and Fairy Tales, so Adaptation Class, Sunday the 9th. We have plenty more coming up too, so definitely check these out if you're interested. And we'll have a QA with a WGA writer, um, Max Perry, on July 15th at noon. You can check the chat also. Nacho has pasted in text, including all of the upcoming classes. Okay, um, we're not exactly going to go down this uh, this overview directly. We're not going to do everything in here, but this is generally what we will be looking at today. We're going to start with just questions like, what is sci-fi? And maybe talk a little about the difference between hard and soft sci-fi, a little about premises and genre conventions. And then I kind of want to not talk too much about stories and move to worlds. So we'll move, we'll move to looking at worlds that are based around a big idea. I mean, a world might mean a single planet in the context of your sci-fi world or, or your sci-fi story. Or we might just say sort of a story world just refers to everything in that universe where that, where that story takes place. So that might be a whole franchise takes place within a story, a single consistent story world, right? So oftentimes these will be based around big ideas. We have things like Altered Carbon, which has this the center, central idea of consciousness upload or transfer of consciousness. And everything sort of branches off from that and is derived from that. Um, let's look at some others. So we have other franchises like Ready Player One. The topic is VR and social media. And the big idea, look how they're slightly distinct, right? The topic is sort of the area of science that the big idea touches upon. But the big idea is the oasis, which is this sort of worldwide interactive metaverse that's kind of like the internet but way better and everyone in the world can access it and sort of walk around it as if it's a sort of second alternate world um we have the movie minority Re and short story by philip k dick minority report which is the topic is criminal justice and crime and the big idea is pre-crime which is this police agency that arrests criminals before they act and last we have the sci-fi show severance the topic is corporate work life and the big idea is this procedure to separate employees' minds into two distinct halves, which have no memory of what the other one half remembers. So there's like a work version and an outside home version. So you can see how these are not exactly full descriptions of the world itself. We're not saying this takes place on a planet where blank and blank and blank. So when we're saying world, we sort of mean the reality that that story takes place in. And if we start using that basis of the big idea, then it allows you to sort of, if you, if you start with that as your kind of core at the heart of your idea web or whatever, it allows you to branch off from there and come up with interesting plot points and, and story elements that connect directly back to that main idea, which is generally a smart thing to do, especially in movies and TV. Books can have multiple big ideas in them, sometimes almost too many big ideas in them, whereas movies... And shows in sci-fi are more often going to revolve around one single central big idea that we're going to dig down deeper into than we would, rather than just introducing a bunch of different concepts, a bunch of different ideas that we will only be able to very shallowly explore. It's a better idea in a movie or show to sort of take one core idea, expand on that one as much as possible. Um, let's look at uh, keeping things cohesive. So... My suggestion is that if you have a bunch of speculative elements in one story, especially, again, in movies and TV, we should be trying to pick one thing that we can dig deeper into and that one source that multiple different points of interest can derive from. So it's helpful to have your speculative elements share the same source in Western media, at least. In the world of things like anime and comic books, this, um, and I know comic books are Western, but like, and, and there, there are different examples of this we've seen in different storytelling traditions, but essentially in like anime and Eastern style storytelling, it's not as unusual to have robots, aliens, uh, angels, fairies, and um, elementals in the same story. And they don't have to have come from the same place, from the same source. Whereas in Western media, more often than not, and I realize there are exceptions to this, especially in the world, in the post Avengers world, where we have big mainstream movies where there's a bunch of characters on a team that all have completely different sources of their powers. So this has become more common in recent years. But unless you're doing something like that, which those are really hard to pull off unless you have full access to that universe or some pre-established, pre-built universe where people already know these characters and all these advantages that come from writing something like Avengers, right? Then it's oftentimes more helpful to have all your, all your speculative elements share that same source. So think of like Iron Man, for instance, we mentioned earlier as like a sci-fi superhero story. And it's a pretty self-contained one. 
There are not other heroes we meet. We don't meet Doctor Strange in that one. We're only in the world of sci-fi in the very first Iron Man movie. And where do all the powers come from? These arc reactors. So Tony Stark makes an arc, has an arc reactor. He uses it to save his life and to make a suit for himself in the cave. And then we have the villain, Obadiah, also makes uses an arc reactor to make himself an even bigger robot suit that he himself can use against our hero. But you see, those both come from the same thing. They both come from arc reactors, which are kind of the central technological c concept of that movie. I understand that as the series goes on, we expand way beyond just that scope. But you can see how uh, for a movie that was intended to sort of kickstart this, or w which ultimately led to kickstarting this larger franchise, we keep everything very contained and streamlined within one movie. We don't start adding in wizards. We don't start adding in crazy aliens within Iron Man 1. We keep the sci-fi sources all the same. It all feels very simple, very self-contained, very cohesive. We can only watch this one, and we can understand it fine. We don't need to watch a bunch of other stuff to get who these characters are or what's going on. Um, and with anime, I, I understand the rules are pretty much out the window, but this is just how it mostly works in, in Western stories. So, like, let's look at a couple examples. So we have, even in franchises that have a lot going on, The Matrix has cyberpunk, superhero action and set pieces, post-apocalyptic setting, space opera, adjacent elements, and advanced AI. But within that world of that first movie, they all stem from the same source. The machines, or we could say the machines and The Matrix itself, which is kind of like a lot of these things exist within that world, but even that was created by the same entities, the, the machines, the architect, I guess we could say, as the, the originator of the Matrix who has sort of allowed all these things to be possible. Um, we have a question in the chat. Is Lovecraft sci-fi, or are the aliens so impossible that they count as fantasy? That depends on the story, because Lovecraft has a lot of different types of creatures in his um, sort of mythology and world. Some of them, I think for the most part, he, he does does think of these things as sci-fi or would define them as sci-fi simply because um, he was uh, sort of pr proposing a world in which these ancient gods are actual entities that might live out there somewhere and that they're not like sort of confined to these other realms like heaven or hell. They could exist in our universe and that they could have direct effect on things going on here or they may not care about us, notice us at all. But yeah, I think a lot of Lovecraft stories are going to be defined as sci-fi simply because, in theory, these things are sort of possible. We could find giant aliens that live beyond the stars that are psychically influencing us or, or things like this. But there's a lot of crossover there, and some of his stories are more in the realm of fantasy than, than sci-fi, such as The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which is a sort of very trippy, fant like Alice in Wonderland-style fantasy story that he's written also. So yeah, depends on the story, largely sci-fi. Jack O'Panton in the chat says, Star Wars is sort of science fantasy. Yes, Star Wars is science fantasy. It involves... Uh, I've heard it's been said that the prequel trilogy is more science fiction focused than the original trilogy, which is more comparable to something like Jason and the Argonauts or like a mythology quest style movie. Whereas the prequels do get a little bit more into things like the ethics and practicality of mass scale cloning and actual scientific principles like that, which were not really present in the first couple. But there's um, a lot of disagreement about that. Sci basically, yeah, science fantasy has elements of both. There are sci-fi elements in Star Wars. There are straight-up fantasy elements. There's wizards. so And we also have wizards that fly ships and use guns. So it's kind of like uh, it mixes and matches at any given time any number of elements from both. Okay, um, what else? So Ender's Game features alien invaders, um orbital vr adjacent military training programs for child soldiers i guess it's not really vr it's more like laser tag kind of in an organized sport way but the latter exists because of the former they have this sort of um advanced space orbital training program because of the alien invaders so again same source edge of tomorrow is a similar thing where edge of tomorrow is a story featuring alien invasion and time loop but how does it work well the time loop is a sort of psychic result of the alien's using their an ability that's inherent to their blood so when that blood gets into a person then they receive the alien's ability to reset that time stream so while we may argue that time travel will never be possible most people will consider time travel to be in the world of sci-fi and that maybe it's somehow theoretically in some crazy world maybe one day possible so in any case it comes from the same thing we have time travel and aliens but the time travel comes from the aliens um, okay, so hope that that's 
clear how you can try to keep things cohesive by just picking the same source that your different scientific elements come from, and it allows you to branch out and have different stuff in one story. You know, you want to have alternate dimensions and time travel in one story. You can do it. Just try to find a way that they can both come from the same thing for the most part. And in books, you have more room for more big ideas, and we have just way more pages and way more ability to explain and tell things in books, so you have a little more freedom there. Okay, so remember that big idea is we're asking what if this technology existed or what if this technology that we already have advanced to this degree? The big idea is asking what conflict would that create or solve or maybe some of both, right? It creates some problems and it also solves other problems. And usually the stories will be about, I mean, a lot of the time the big idea or sort of central question of the movie, book, or, or, or TV show is... Um, what are the ramifications of this big idea? What are the technological things that we can use it for? What are the hazards and the challenges? And can it be beaten? Can it be overcome? Can we use it on our side? We're just kind of approaching this question of the big idea from as many different angles as possible within one work. And sci-fi is really much really about this. People come to sci-fi for these interesting questions and for original ideas, even if it's just original takes on stuff that we have seen before. So um, let's maybe go a bit into designing worlds. Perhaps we can start a little bit on. Did I not? I thought I had a bunch of planet designing slides on here. Maybe that's a different slideshow, actually. Uh, I think that's a different slideshow. No problem. OK, so in fact, let's maybe go back a couple steps and let's look at hard versus soft sci-fi um, and break down that difference there. So. Um, of course, we know sci-fi is fiction that deals with the impact of actual or imagined science upon society or individuals, but the realism with which we portray that science and the sort of uh, how strict we need to be with the rules governing that science, they fall on a spectrum that we are going to call hard to soft, hard versus soft. They have this in different genres too. Hard versus soft fantasy is also a thing, but in any case, in this context, hard science or hard sci-fi versus soft sci-fi, what are the differences? So. Hard sci-fi is going to be more based in scientific reality, in which science and tech are integral to the plot that might touch more on real and proven principles and technology pieces that are at least theoretically one day possible. And the rules work in a very consistent, predictable, and repeatable way. Our emphasis is on plausibility and on these strict rules. The plot might hinge on applications of any number of real kind of technological principles like math, chemistry, physics. Think of like The Martian, right? The Martian is a hard sci-fi story. By anyone's definition, we have to look at, you know, how many real principles actually get applied. The main character actually has to work within scientific reality to find a way to escape his situation. And there's not really fantasy in hard sci-fi. On the hardest end of the spectrum, there's nothing that might be considered fantastical. So there's not there's gonna be less things like psychic powers, which sometimes do fall psychic stuff does fall into sci-fi sometimes, as some purport that maybe in some ways these things will be possible and I think we've seen with brain implants and stuff like that, to some extent, these things can be possible. So um, keep that in mind, but largely in hard sci-fi, we are going to avoid any straight up fantasy. We have a little bit less emphasis on the sense of wonder um, that fantasy and soft sci-fi allow us to revel in more. That's not to say there can be no sense of wonder in hard sci-fi. There definitely can, but it works a little differently. We have some examples here, things like Ex Machina, The Martian, Gravity, Interstellar, Contact, Moon, things like this, Jurassic Park, which are all based on, even if they are exaggerated, they are using these real scientific ideas as we understand them, and coming up with stories and conflicts based on those ideas, and sort of probing the possibilities and ramifications of those ideas. And then we have soft sci-fi on the other end, which is characters and relationships becoming more integral than scientific fidelity. Science doesn't really have to be consistent with how it works in the real world, it really only has to be consistent in that world. We have stronger emphasis on social sciences, things like history, sociology, economics, or politics, taking precedence over physics and chemistry and hard data. Tech levels can use a lot of hand-waving and sort of fake explanations that it essentially does sometimes cross over into fantasy, but it does have to maintain that veneer of plausibility. It has to be, it has to seem at least that there is a rational explanation for how these things work in the world, even if we don't have to fully draw out a diagram to show us how laser guns work. This would be everything from you know, Back to the Future, The Iron Giant, Avatar, Eternal Sunshine on the Spotless Mind, Inception, things like this. 
where we don't really need to dive too deeply into the specific scientific principles behind what's going on or the science that is allowing a robot to be as big as it is in clear violation of the square cube law or whatever. But you get the idea. So hard, more realistic, more down to earth, science and tech more integral to the plot. And we can actually have your characters solve their problems using science a bit more in hard sci-fi because it's applying principles that also work in real life. So the more that your audience understands how your systems at play are functioning, the more that it allows your character the ability to solve their problems with those systems. And if the case is that we are simply using actual applications of science in your story, then the audience has all the tools they need to follow along so we can use science to solve problems more. In soft sci-fi, if you just make up some techno babble explanation of how science can fix the problem, you're going to run into trouble because it's going to start seeming a little fake and inauthentic to your reader. And we don't want to just come up with some deus ex machina solution that just, you oh, you happen to have just the exact right robot for the job. We have some questions in the chat. Um, superhero stories tend to fall under soft sci-fi, right? Or are there some that fall under hard sci-fi? Um, there are certainly some superheroes that use more hard sci-fi type principles but largely we're using soft yeah we don't we want to see robots fighting monsters and aliens and shooting lasers and all that kind of fun stuff like x-men is super soft sci-fi it is sci-fi the characters are getting their powers from a gene mutation called the x gene but what does that gene do oh you know anything anything from let you control the weather to super healing to super strength to magnet powers to anything else so it's like, oh, a gene did it, so it is sci-fi, but it's as soft as it gets because the gene just does whatever we want it to do. Question, is Watchmen comic or movie sci-fi? If so, is it hard or soft sci-fi? So Watchmen is, yes, um, the comic and movie are, and TV show are um, sci-fi, but they're in the kind of world of comics where we have that variable levels of both. And that's the thing is that one work doesn't have to be all one hard. It doesn't have to be all hard or all soft. Some stories will have elements of both of those things. Um, like for instance, within Watchmen, we have Doctor Manhattan, who uh, is essentially kind of a godlike alien figure. Or he has he was in this like industrial, uh, or not industrial accident, a scientific lab kind of um, accident, like ripped his body apart and reformed it. And when it did, he now has near godlike alien powers and can reshape reality around him. Do we really explain why that is? No, not really. Do we get into the specific mechanics behind how that works? No. Um, so it's it's in that scientific or it's in that comic science world where some things will have consistent rules that harken back to things in the real world. Sometimes we use completely made up scientific rules, principles, terms, or uh, you know sub substances, whatever it is. Like think of unobtainium in Avatar, right? Avatar is pretty soft sci-fi. We're not actually having to base any of these things on real technology. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, Jack says, a good inspiration for sci-fi words is to watch documentaries on exoplanets. I remember some of those are crazy. Yeah, real documentaries, always a good source of inspiration for sci-fi. So remember that we're emphasizing originality. Part of the promise of the genre is that we're seeing something we haven't seen before, or haven't seen exactly like this, haven't seen combined in this exact way. We like to include some kind of speculation on the world as it is in real life and where we're going as a species, the effect certain technologies have on human nature and how human nature might be altered, shaped, or certain aspects of our of who we are might be brought into focus by this technology, which is an interesting thing about the show Black Mirror, for instance. Black Mirror, a lot of people think, is the show about how technology is bad, uh, but it's actually not really. It's um, kind of about all the things that technology can do. And of course, many episodes do end in things going terribly wrong, but it's always because of how people act when they have these things. And so it's almost using that tech as a way to explore human nature rather than the other way around. We're not trying to really explore the technology as much as we are trying to see what it makes people do. But in any case, sci-fi heavily emphasizes these cutting edge ideas and very progressive values. And it's about how things could maybe theoretically be it's not really a genre for regressive conservative old ideas um, we're trying to think to the future we look to the future for inspiration and thinking how the world could be a different and better place sometimes worse place too of course um, we like to look at the dangers that different technologies trends or um, possibilities present but sci-fi has this element of um hopefulness to it uh, a lot of the time a lot of um uh some of the best sci-fi work has that element of maybe things are all screwed if we go down this route, but if we, but now that we know about that, we can avoid that route and therefore create, you know, a better future with enriched lives and where we are using this technology to make 
the world a better place. Last, there's just kind of a coolness factor. We want to see awesome and unique imagery, character moments, and thrills that are possible only in a world that has your speculative elements. So that's when you know your movie, show, or book is really clicking, is when your premise scenes are going to revolve around ideas, um, these set piece moments, or these big blockbuster moments, as I sometimes call them, are going to be things that are only possible in your world. Uh, here's a couple genre examples. The kind in, in movies and shows, I think we have these main four genres. In books, we have way more. But in movies and shows, thriller and horror, everything from The Invisible Man to Alien, The Fly, the, th the horrific element is usually going to be the villain of the movie, or in some cases, there may be a more mundane villain and your protagonist is using science or technology to combat them somehow, or is otherwise in a world with some kind of speculative element that plays into their conflict. We have action stories where, again, the either the threat is something science fiction based or the way that we combat it is science fiction based or both. In something like Men in Black, it's kind of both, right? We're fighting aliens and we're using advanced technology to do that. So there's two different speculative elements tied together by the same central idea, and we are using one against the other. Adventure is going to be stuff that doesn't necessarily revolve around interpersonal violence between intelligent entities, which is how we define action. We have to have intelligent opponents for a story in my world at least to count as action if we <coughs> if we don't have intelligent opponents and there is still danger and it could be danger of in the sense that your characters are going through a hazardous environment fighting dangerous animals uh, braving dangerous weather conditions maybe just getting from one place to the next in their world is dangerous and difficult providing life and death stakes then we are falling more into the genre of adventure like interstellar gravity Armageddon. There's no direct personal peer-to-peer -peer violence in these stories, really. There's a little bit um, here and there. But in any case, the majority of the threat that is going to be coming from the environment. And last, we have drama, which are going to be things like Gattaca, Her, Truman Show, Arrival, Truman Show being a, like a dramedy. These are going to be stories in which a speculative element has been introduced into a domestic situ or a dramatic situation, um, or perhaps the dramatic situation stems from that technology in the first place. So there's a bunch more, but in movies, this is tend to be what people think of as the the broad spectrum. Um, so 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 many more in books, but um, in in books we just have a lot more freedom in every way. I'll just leave this up because Nacho has collected this great uh, collage of different novels and short stories in sci-fi worlds. We see all these different categories from alternate history, cyberpunk, dystopian, space opera, steampunk, military, time travel. And of course we can see different, ver like we sometimes see more commercial versions of these. Sometimes we see more literary science fiction that is approaching these topics from a different perspective. We see some upmarket, we see some uh, just very popular commercial fiction. So this can come from any, this can come in any voice, in any shape and size. Lots of different types of sci-fi out there. Okay, um, I think that I want to uh, uh, look briefly at my sort of just planet world designing slides um, in which I think is from my week two of the previous sci-fi boot camp. We won't spend way too long on just the planets themselves. Here we go. But I want to talk world building and all the things that go into that. Remember, we're defining world as the story world that your, that your narrative takes place in. So the process of developing a detailed and plausible fictional world um, that's w what we call world building. And why should we be spending time on this? There's a couple different answers. One is because this is just one of the big reasons people come to sci-fi, especially in books. We have so much more room to develop the world, atmosphere, environment, different elements of plant life, flora, fauna, um, different cultures and societies and technology levels. You can have multiple planets, a whole, you can have multiple universes. You can flesh your story space out as much as you want in a book. And people just read these stories for these things. They like to have their imagination tickled and opened up by imagining the different possibilities of what a different world might be like. Beyond that, we want to, um, if we define the elements of your world carefully by the halfway point, then your your audience, your readers, should have all the tools that they need to uh, figure out where the story is going or to, like, we shouldn't be introducing new rules past the halfway point for the most part. Um, but when we have effectively set up our world, then we can find ways to layer in the information and give us just enough exposition 
And if we've built our world carefully, then we are giving enough exposition for the reader to understand it, and we're not doing any more. You don't need to have a full, huge chapter at the beginning of your book that explains the formation of the solar system and how every planet came together and the gas clouds and big bangs and stuff like that. We just need to know exactly enough for us to understand that story. So we should spend a little time on world building in sci-fi simply because sci-fi is great for taking advantage of different worlds and great for imagining different possibilities and having all kinds of fun just with that idea. But we should stop when it becomes overbearing or when it becomes all you're doing. If you get stuck just world building forever, then you're never going to write your story. So we want to build just around the reader's experience so we see we learn just the perfect amount. Um, here's a question. When pitching sci-fi, should you clarify if it's hard or soft, or is that irrelevant? When pitching to, like, you mean, like, producers or things like that, they mostly won't really be using terms like this in the first place. You might have to even define it for them if you get into it, so I would not probably even worry about it when pitching sci-fi movies and shows. Um, if you're, if the producer or development executive you're talking with asks about it or, or uses those terms, then feel free to dive into it. But, um... These are more often discussed in the world of novels than they are in movies and TV, and you don't really pitch novels in the same way. So I would say largely don't worry about this one in the world of pitching. All right, so world building. Here's a question from me. How would you do world building in a situation where the characters are familiar with the world, but the audience isn't? Good question, um, and in different contexts, and we can do this in very different ways. Um, it gives you a lot of opportunities when the characters know about the world, but the reader doesn't, because it allows your point of view characters. And let's let's just think books for a minute, because in books, you're, if we're in a character's point of view, whether it's first person or close third, then we may be following a character that knows more about the world than we do. That happens all the time. In fact, in the majority of cases, your characters start knowing more about the world than we do, except if it's you're doing like a portal or something like that, where like Stargate, we show up in the new world, we have no idea what anything is here is, and we need to learn it all one step at a time. Most of the time, your characters know something about the world that they live in. Um, but you can do a couple things to, you can approach that in a few different ways. One way is you, if you start with a sort of farm boy type character that in, within their secluded corner of that world, they understand how things work, but they may not have a broader picture of things. And so part of the fun of watching Luke experience the galaxy and stuff, you know, our farm boy in Star Wars, Luke, then we can see, he, since he knows the basics, he, he basically knows everything that we could figure out on our own. And so anything else he learns, we have to learn alongside him. So having a character that needs to expand their knowledge of the world and maybe they can share a little bit with us in their own narration in their in their scenes we can see like little flashes of their understanding of how the world works but the the full picture of how things work is something that they still need to find out themselves so following them doing that can be really satisfying um there's also the opportunity when your character is like a journeyman and knows some things about the world that the fact that they have gaps in their knowledge can be really useful for your story because you can just give the audience the bare essentials. Your character says, oh no, that's a, that, that, I know that that's a very powerful alien monster. What specifically can it do? I don't know specifically what it can do. That just allows you to sort of give the audience just enough, and it's just an effective tool. I think the Sabriel series by Garth Nix, it's fantasy, not sci-fi, but does, has, does a really good job of having a sort of experienced journeyman main character that knows a fair amount about the world, and we use that to just give the audience the perfect amount of information. We have a question or comment from Meep. Go ahead. Um, another thing I wanted to ask was um, the idea of sci-fi is about the wonderment and the intrigue of the world, but is there a way that you can sort of portray it to in a way where it's like this is the char this world is the character's everyday life, but to the audience it's something that's still supposed to be kind of like interesting? Like if the character finds the world to be sort of like um, – not not necessarily mundane, but if the world is presented as being like similar to our own, is there a way that you could still sort of make that be something that's kind of interesting? Like you would still have some of the same stuff that you have in our in our like I guess modern day society, but it's in an area that's like far more like fantastical and like uh, I guess scientifically sophisticated. Is there a way that you can still make that seem? interesting like the way you're trying to portray it is this is the character's everyday life type deal if that makes sense yeah i mean um, most of the time when we go into a story we're going to see what the character's everyday life is like and they're going to be used to their own world already so it the sense of wonder that we get from fantasy and sci-fi are not necessarily always through the characters um okay. sometimes they can be 
sometimes they are, especially in like you see why portal fantasy is so easy and fun and accessible, right? Like Harry Potter it's the easiest thing to understand ever. You go, th- you're the, you are like the kid. He goes through a magic portal into the world. He has to learn about it step by step, and everything's wondrous and amazing to him. But it's not wondrous and amazing to Ron and Hermione, is it? Right. So, but and but that doesn't stop it from being inter- interesting and amazing to us. So it's mm. helpful if you have some characters that are able to experience that wonder of seeing and learning about these things. You don't need them per se. And like, uh, it just it means that we'll have to experience them a little differently. Like a character that is just learning about things for the first time, maybe they play around with these new things. They try out the different possibilities and they, um, they're they able to, uh, like they are curious about how, how mm. these new elements work. And when they are curious, then they will do fun stuff that helps them learn the answers to what these things are. If we have characters that are already used to the world, we can still get that sense of wonder. I mean, it may be that your characters are, you know, commuting to work uh, on a super highway through space or something like that, right? It's like the Jetsons almost, where the Jetsons mm. world, they're 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 not impressed or amazed by their world at all. Um, but we can still see like the problems that they've solved, that that they have s- fixed in their world that we haven't solved in our world. Like they have no pollution or whatever, or they have they, nobody has to work. They just press a button and then a robot does all the work for them. Things like this, which still instill a sense of wonder. We just won't, um, if you don't have a character that's also experiencing that wonder, you have to approach it a little differently. And um, mm. I would, uh, like, how specifically would I suggest approaching it differently? That's a good question that I'm now asking myself. Because, um, like, it, 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 it's like, it falls into the, it falls into the same category of, like, um, I, I guess like it falls into the same category of like oh this is what I do every day and just yeah just a way to make that seem interesting because they're all they're already kind of used to it they've experienced and kind of lived in this world so it's obviously yeah. not going to seem is, all that great to them yeah and in fact that I don't think that really gets that far in the way of it, of enjoying the sense of wonder around something in fact sometimes that makes it a little funnier or a little bit more entertaining in a way if for instance um your characters are a little bit annoyed by something that we would consider to be amazing in our world, right? Like uh, Mm. imagining, for instance, there's a moment in, I can't remember if this made it into the actual episode or or the show, but I I read the script of Carnival Row, which was called Killing on Carnival Row um, years ago. This turned into a fantasy show on Amazon. I remember there's a scene where some cops are just doing an investigation and one of their witnesses is like a Selkie or a Pixie or something like that. And Mm. all, all of the testimony that it gives is in rhymes. And they're like, oh God, dang I, I hate doing testimony from kelpies can somebody help us out please i can't speak rhymes and so it's like a hin- it's a hindrance to them it's annoying to them but it's wondrous to us in, in its own way so I, th- I i think that you just experience it differently that, that's that's what i'm getting at we experience it differently mm. we get the same we get a different emotion out of it we might to me that's a little bit funny that they are annoyed by something that we would consider so magical right or it makes it feel a little more real it it's less i guess I guess in a in a world where it's normal to the characters, it's more of an ambient sense of wonder rather than a it all hits you at once and we're blown away by it sense of wonder. It's like mm. we gradually learn about the world and we we sort of become suffused with this sense of wonder that at at once we gain the same understanding of the world that the characters have. Well, well, like what if it's like a situation where it's just kind of like you're in this sci-fi world and it's like, wow, this is still something they have to deal with even now. Could that have like the same sort of like um kind of feeling where it's like wow you have this world you have all like 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 let's say it's a world where vehicles can move super duper fast but you still have to go to like the dmv to get your license and like that's still like yeah okay i guess you might be able to just make it awesome too sometimes like if you just if if that's important to you for your story is creating that sense of wonder and fun then Mm -hmm. you can come up with now that we we may have uh they're experiencing some similar problems than we experience in the to ones we actually have in the real world um, those things come with problems too. So, so like while while they let's say we have super fast cars, God, what would car accidents look like in a world where cars can go at the speed of light or or whatever, right? So, I think that uh, yeah, it allows us to explore these things from different angles, and it's a different type of wonder. It's the type of wonder where it it builds very gradually, rather rather than hitting us all at once. Okay, okay. Thank you, Connor. Sure. Thanks for the question. Meep always has good questions. Hard to answer sometimes, but that's that's how you know they're good. Okay, let's talk world building. Um, world building is all around us, all the time. And in movies and TV, those are our visual mediums. This was from a slideshow on sci-fi movies. So um, we 
in movies and TV need to show how the world and society are different while keeping careful focus on our main character, his or her goal, progress, and journey. Complex film and TV world building is best done through this process of gradual unveiling. If we just have a big, long title card at the beginning that explains how all the different technology works and all the different aliens work and all this stuff, we can just get bored with the exposition dump, the dump of information. Um, so try to we like to learn things through and during action. So as your characters are solving their problems and living their lives, we like to see these things come up organically, one piece at a time. And therefore, we kind of, we we have to, we're, we're paying attention, we're piecing together how the world works, rather than having someone just explain it all to us. Dan says, Star Wars does exposition dump, just saying. Star Wars does exposition dump on the plot, but not on the technology, and not on the, like, it doesn't start out with, the Force is this, and it works this way. It works through midichlorians. Jedi have laser swords called lightsabers. It doesn't give us exposition on that. It just catches us up in terms of, like, the politics and the warfare, and yes, that is true. It does do that. Um, so let's look at world building all around us in real life. Um, small visual and auditory details do a lot of work in movies and TV. So like, let's think of COVID times, for instance. We all lived through COVID and we are sort of still pretty much in COVID times. What was it like going to the grocery store at the height of the pandemic? You guys remember like sanitizing stations, announcements on the uh, PA system, masks and elbow bumps and, and fist pounds and these things people were doing. What else do we notice? A bit dystopian, says Dan. Yeah, it was a bit dystopian, wasn't it? It still is, maybe, in some... I'm not sure how locked down some countries are. I think we had a hand raised. I called on somebody to speak. Uh, go ahead. You'll have to accept the invitation. Is... Philosophy a form of world building? Philosophy? Um, it can be. Um, in sci-fi, philosophy often is an aspect of the world, or maybe we it takes place in a world where we have been forced to sort of think of philosophical principles differently. Um, do you have a specific example in mind? Well, my story is uh, definitely has philosophy as a major motivation for evil acts. Like, okay. there is a lot of thought process behind why people do evil. Okay, that might, and that you're saying that's just like those philosophies exist in your world, and your villains are characters that have studied or who live by those philosophies? Yeah. Okay, then in that case, for sure. I mean, things like the Sith Code or the Jedi Code, right? Those yeah. are elements of sci fi philosophy that lead to interesting elements of. Uh, that world, those, you know, the world those characters live in, the societies, for sure. Alright. Uh, I don't, I think that's it for now. Do you want to answer this question of, you remember, so, grocery shopping during COVID times, what did we notice, uh, what was different? Uh, shortages. Shortages, great. Yep, what was, what were we short on? Mostly toilet paper, but I feel, I, I feel like there are others, but I can't remember. I think people bought all the hand sanitizer out. Like, I, yeah, maybe. But when there's a lot of panic, the economy tends to mess up or there's shortages on supplies because people are buying them in mass quantities. Mm hmm. Yep, definitely. So, imagine, I just liked to imagine when I was grocery shopping during COVID time, imagine you from five years ago sees this footage of yourself walking around the store. Everyone's wearing masks, there's shortages on all the shelves. There's mm -hmm. an announcements on the on the PA system that are like, thank you for staying six feet apart, right? There's stations you go to, you stick your hand under to get the hand sanitizer. Nobody's shaking hands anymore. They're all elbow bumping or like bowing to each other or whatever. What would we even think had happened if we saw that all around us? Um, and I like to imagine that we would, that's just an effective way to, to look at world building, right? Like your characters, it's not like when you go into the store, there's a guy standing there that's like, hey, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's necessary that you put this hand sanitizer on and then they show you a graphic of all the effects and ramifications of the pandemic. No, we just kind of oh, yeah. pick up on those things. Like just going through your day-to-day -day routine, you see clues that allow you to put together what's going on in the world, right? So to be clear, you're saying don't show, don't tell essentially how the world works. 
Yeah, in movies and TV especially. Um, in, yeah. in books, it works. We can do exposition exposition a little bit differently. But in movies yeah. and TV, yeah, we want to show. We want to. Sh- we don't. We don't like to feel like we're taking a class or being lectured to. We like to watch your characters try to solve problems in interesting ways. And as they do, as they go about their lives and attempt to overcome their conflicts, then we notice things around them. We notice the tools they use, the words they use. We notice the things that are on TV in their world, right? We notice things that are in posters and the covers of books. We notice um, uh, all kinds of stuff around your characters that tells us what has shaped this, what is this world like and what has made it that way. So I guess one question I thought of is Mm -hmm. when it comes to like superpowers existing for a long time, possibly due to genetics, is that something you could show or is that something that, all right. Let's think about ways we could show that superpowers have existed for a long time. When you say a long time, do you mean like all of human history or do you mean like 50 years? Like enough time that a company has decided to make a prison for supervillains that have existed for a long time. Okay, great. Well, then, yeah, I could see all kinds of interesting ways we could show that without having to explain it. I mean, um, the uh, there's a big problem nowadays with people not wanting prisons and homeless shelters and things like this built in their backyards, right? I imagine there's going to be huge pushback to people building a super prison anywhere near them, right? So when your characters are walking by City Hall, we see a protest against, you know, don't build this, the super prison in our city, something like mm-hmm. that. Or we can imagine... People handing out pamphlets that are like "vote against the super prison" and on yeah. you know section one hundred and one of the upcoming law or the upcoming ballot. Um, we need you to vote this way. Um, Maybe the opposite way, where sure. people are pro thing. Yeah, exactly. We could see um, protesters and counter protesters, as some people think that the prison should happen, some think that it shouldn't. Um, I think that uh, in a, in a world where superpowers have existed for a long time, the world would look very different than it does today. Mm-hmm. Probably, um, because you might imagine that every war has gone differently, right? Yeah. Unless it happens to be one of these worlds where every, like, that's where you run into a big problem in sci-fi world building, isn't it? Where it's like, we say superpowers have existed for all time, but basically stuff looks like it does now, but there's just no way it would. How, yeah. how would, how would things possibly look like they do now if every hundred people can shoot lasers out of their eyes or, or things like this? The movie Bright with which was fantasy not sci-fi but that to Mm -hmm. me kind of had this problem a little bit where it was like there's orcs and elves and fairies and magic and stuff but it still looks exactly like modern day los angeles and functions exactly the same just seems strange just leads to questions Mm -hmm. let's ask one more question in the shopping mall thing or the shopping trip thing what would a shopping trip look like in a world where there's 10 foot squid aliens integrated with the human population living peacefully with us so imagine your character goes to the grocery store early in the morning before there's anyone else around. So we're not going to see any aliens. But mm-hmm. what would this shopping trip look like? And how could we use this to clue our audience in on how the world was different? I picture, well, depending on the, depending on if these aliens are allowed into society or not, there might be items that could possibly use more than two hands for Ooh, these octopi great. or squids or whatever. Yeah, like the tongs in the tong aisle where you normally, like it only yeah. is or scissors or things like that that are fit for one hand you could see one with yeah. a bunch of different attachments on it tongs that could be used by an octopus that'd be great yeah. what else would we see i would also see some maybe some pro either people would treat it either like race or disability where like it's a controversial subject and is treated as such whether you are pro or anti or whatever depending on the stance of these aliens it, oh, that's a good idea. It's probably different for each country or society or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Different societies have different levels of acceptance towards the aliens, sort of like something like District 9, where they're kind of um, discriminated mm-hmm. against. Nacho in the chat has mentioned calamari free zone signs. So, yeah, we could have some discrimination against the aliens, perhaps. I was thinking maybe in this world they're just part of society, but we can think of any different possibility here. Verb says larger entrances, definitely. And an alien food section. Yeah, I could see the alien food section also having really tall shelves, right? And all the alien food would be on the 10-foot tall shelf because they have no problem reaching that. Yeah. I like to think uh, of just just like shopping tells us a lot. Like a character on a shopping trip tells us a lot about what is normal in that world. And things that we don't spend too much time focusing on seem more normal to those characters than things we spend a lot of time paying attention to. 
So sometimes when you're world building in sci-fi, if you sort of gloss over some things, it can kind of actually make them normalized within your world. Um, imagine, for instance, your character is, um, they go from the grocery store, they walk past a jewelry shop, and we don't focus on it or, or pay any extra attention to it at all, but we see they're selling giant rings in the jewelry store right that are meant to go over a tentacle instead of Mm -hmm. over a person's finger and maybe they're even selling sets of engagement rings one of them's tiny one of them's huge oh okay we're learning maybe people and aliens can get married in this world um so background details stuff that we glimpse and that we see and that we don't focus on can be some of the most effective tools for world building rather than stuff that you delve very deeply into because this helps us set that the baseline expectation of what's normal go ahead on that note, I picture what would happen if an alien, if a human tried on a squid engagement ring. Would there be <laughs> something different that is consequential? I'm not sure. It, yeah, I guess it depends. Um, it would hang off of. It would be like a big bracelet on them. I would think, right? It would kind of yeah be like a probably. Big, not, not yeah, or maybe there's a special device. material that is equivalent to diamonds to them, but might be harmful for humans. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Nacho mentioned disposable, quote, gloves for tentacles. <laughs> so maybe we could see a set of, there's like a bunch of latex gloves in one aisle, and right next to it, there's a bunch of tentacle covers. That could be kind of cool. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for asking your questions and for participating. I like how Verb has also mentioned in the chat, play areas for alien kids as well as human kids. So maybe a big tank of water for the kids to play in at the Ikea play area. (laughs) Yeah, the McDonald's uh, ball pit. They've got the ball pit next to the slime pit. (laughs) Uh, There's all kinds of fun you can have doing this, right? Hand sanitizer next to the tentacle cleaning machine, Nacho says. So setting the expectation of what is normal is a really key element of your sci-fi world. And then often these make really good setups for later. Do you guys remember the early sequences of Minority Report when Tom Cruise's character is walking through malls and stuff and every advertisement like reads your eye and can tell who you are and it's like hey Mr. Anderson have you decided to come to Gap today or another one it's like hey Mr. Anderson how are you enjoying those Levi jeans you just bought you know we sort of see that as a setup early on that seems like just a world building detail but later becomes a really key plot point in the latter half of the story so or basically the midpoint is where um, John changes swaps, swaps out his eyes Um, But that just makes for, like, world building as set up for a a later plot element can be really effective. Lots of sci-fi does that very well. Verb asks, what would an alien bathroom look like? I don't really know. Uh, Depends on what the aliens uh, have to do in there. Um, You know, could be any number of things. Uh, Might just be a big hole in the floor. Might be a tube that they need to plug a tentacle into to vent their, I don't know, maybe they process all their waste and it turns into a gas or a liquid or maybe, like, uh, fumes. They need to vent their fumes through a fume station, something like that. No idea. Depends how gross your aliens are. So I hope this idea of just establishing the baseline of normalcy makes sense as a tool for both movies, TV, books, all these things, the things that you don't focus on and don't elaborate on and don't pay attention to tell us a huge amount about your world. And you want to be careful with that and not leave something super important as gloss like you don't want to gloss too lightly over something that we need to know about but you can use this to your advantage by um normalizing things by having your characters not remark upon them by having them just part of the background part of the details like if your your character just goes to the store and buys some ham and cheese we might learn more about the world then and in a more fun active and engaging way than we would have if they had stayed home and just watched a documentary about the alien invasion Okay. Um, what do what love? Else? Oh, sorry. Don't want to watch that clip. Um, let's look at planets. So um, we are assuming a lot of stories take place on Earth. Most stories, I would say, take place on Earth. But um, a lot of sci-fi can take place on different planets too. Whether whether or not we're looking at a sort of alternate or modified Earth, or if you're looking at another pl- a planet in our solar system, or maybe a planet beyond our solar system. Um, there's a couple of rules that, first of all, need to define what a planet is. So according to the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, there are three requirements to a, that make a celestial body qualify as a planet. First, it has to orbit around a sun. Next, it has to have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, which means that it has become the dominant celestial object in that orbit and no longer competes for space 
with other major bodies. So that's why Pluto is not considered a planet anymore, because it hasn't sort of cleared its neighborhood of other large celestial bodies. And last, a planet has to be round, or very close to round in shape. Um, so that's, that's how we understand planets within our universe, within your crazy wacky universe. Maybe you have a cube or a pyramid-shaped planet or any number of things, but just the way that gravity works, it tends to crush everything towards the center and make things sort of spherical over time. Evenly spherical. Um, so uh, let's look at some more at different types of planet and also habitability. There's a habitability index, a fictional sort of habitability index, which groups um, are sort of types of stars or star systems into four major categories, which are thought to host habitable planets. The thing is, in real life, we haven't really discovered other planets that, that are, are habitated by intelligent life. So we don't actually know for sure um, in the vast universe that we live in exactly what a planet full of life would be. So we have to use our imaginations and we have to use the, the principles that we have access to. Let's look at the major types of uh, star systems in the habitability index. So um, to begin with, we have white star systems um, that might lead to either desert or island planets. Um, and these are going to have surface water percentages that are going to be below 30% for the desert planet, so very low on water, or above 80% for the uh, island planet. And island planet being largely submerged, meaning the only land are microcontinents and island chains. The oceans tend to be shallow and warm. I think we saw a great example of the, a white star planet in Rogue One during the climax of the movie. I forget the name. Somebody should look it up and let me know. The name of the planet during the finale sequence of Rogue One is an awesome example of island planet, white star system with microcontinents, islands, shallow, warm oceans with a tropical climate and more advanced underwater ecosystem. Um, and then we have desert planets, which is going to be best seen in stuff like Dune, right? With large, lifeless deserts and slow plate tectonics, we have really cold nights, really hot days, and what little land life exists will be close to the small ocean sea basins and grow no taller than a meter, usually. So smaller, squat animals and, and very hardy, dry plants. But it's going to have to be grouped around wherever the water is in that world, because in our current conceptions of life, we pretty much believe that life requires water in some form or another. Scarif, says Jack. Scarif was the planet from Rogue One. Thank you so much. Uh, yellow stars are going to... Well, first of all, also, also note the color of the sky is going to be different in these different planet types. White stars are going to lead to a navy blue sky. Yellow stars are going to lead to just a st sort of standard blue sky, and this is what we have. We have a yellow star sun. So that's going to be, in our planet, Earth analog, 50 to 80% water. I think our planet's like something like 65 70% water, something like that. Um, and just like Earth, these planets will have a wide variety of climactic climatic conditions caused by continental plates, richly diverse biospheres, and moderate planetary climates. So this is pretty different from how we see a lot or conceive of a lot of planets in the Star Wars galaxy, in which case they usually only have one major biome um, that defines that planet entirely. Um, or we maybe there's some warm place on Hoth or somewhere, but uh, for the most part, since we since it's a movie series, first and foremost, it's a movie series. So each place that we go has to have a really distinct color palette, really distinct set of, you know, rules and things that show up there, creatures that show up there, ecology, habitability, wildlife, stuff like that. And it's just helpful if we use that sort of shorthand of this one environment is what the whole planet is like. And so Star Wars does that very liberally. Um, we might imagine that if we read the books, maybe there are more different biomes within Tatooine or things like that. But usually in Star Wars, one type of environment or one type of climate per planet we also, within a yellow star system with a blue sky, could end up with 30 to 50% water, at which point we might have a swamp planet with low surface features giving us extensive swamp lands and high amounts of global precipitation. Solid ground would be mostly lifeless and glaciers would cover the polar ice regions. I think Naboo is a good example of this in Star Wars. Um, orange star, seafoam green sky, which would be really cool and we almost never see in movies or shows, green skies like that. Um, this is going to be either wet or jungle planets, so pretty high saturation and surface water percentages with 50 to 80 percent on the wet planets made up of shallow seas and low topography on its largest continents primitive vegetation but very widespread and high amounts of global precipitation if there is a lot of vegetation it's usually going to be underwater so there will still be a lot of oxygen uh, on wet planets in, in theory jungle planets are featuring swamplands rainforests jungles island chains and a lot of surface vegetation thriving ecosystems lots of animals and no glaciers in the polar regions. They're usually a little too hot. 
And last we have Red Star, which is going to lead to Green Sky, and we're going to, again, be on the, the world of extremes here, right? So as opposed to before we talked Desert Planet, Island Planet, here we're looking at Ice Planet and Extreme Planet. Ice planets are going to have large polar ice caps, glaciers, ice-covered oceans, glacial carvings which have created mountain ranges, and life largely being found underwater or adapted to that extreme cold. So the majority of life on ice planets might be under the surface. And then last we have extreme planet. So everything from dust deserts uh, with little oceans, but just extreme, extreme temperatures. This is probably less than 30% water saturation. Highly specialized and adaptable life, widespread and thriving. But again, that would be very specialized to live within those extreme conditions. We're not going to see like uh, humans in oh, an extreme planet usually. Okay, so you have a lot of different options in terms of habitability, uh, biomes presenting different challenges and different opportunities for your characters, especially if we are watching or reading a story that's based on colonization or, or exploration of these different planet types, then you should do your research and know how these are kind of working. I mean, let's break down planet Ryloth from Star Wars. Um, and this is something that's not really explored that much in the movies, and maybe it's glimpsed in the shows a couple times but in the books and, you know, the expanded universe material, we have enough information to build a somewhat comprehensive view of planet Ryloth. So let's ask ourselves what kind of conflicts would maybe come up on this planet, how this would affect the planet's flora and fauna, and how all of this is going to sort of, we're always going back to and, and stemming from the geographical and astronomical features of the planet and asking how would it affect the society, technology, and trade. Okay, so let's break down planet Ryloth. Ryloth is the home of the Twi'lek species, um, which are the people with the two sort of tentacles coming out of two sides of their heads. These are called leku um, in uh, their own language, and they it's also a language, they can speak a sort of sign language using their leku as well. And it, I believe, if I'm correct, that it contains part of their brains extend out into their leku as well. Um, so they look like people, though. They're, they come in a bunch of different colors. They're usually blue, purple, or green. Um, so there's some red ones, and there's some different colors of uh, Twi'lek, but in any case... Ryloth is the planet they live on. The atmosphere is breathable. The climate is hot and humid, and it has this really interesting feature to it where the it is tidally locked around its star. As a result, Ryloth finds one side of its surface constantly in day, and the other side is constantly night because they're rotating at like even speeds. So it, it rotates around the star at the same uh, in in such a way that one side is always facing that star. So that means that one side is hot, one side is cold, and the sentient race that came into its own on Ryloth, the Twi'lek, came to colonize the middle region, the mountain ranges in the border zone between the hot and the cold, somehow eking out their existence despite the lack of wildlife, all within that kind of very shallow, I guess we'd call it, um, uh, the um, I forget exactly what that type of region is called, like a transition in between two different biomes. But everything is based around this. We have the hot side, we have the cold side. The hot and cold side are not really habitable by our intelligent species. As a result, all intelligent creatures are forced to live on that thin strip in the middle. They're they're on like a sort of equator around the planet. And we can read here and see a bunch of different points of interest, flora and fauna and stuff like this. It's okay if you don't pay attention too much attention to this. We have um, the population, 1.5 billion intelligent entities that live in that strip of half hot, half cold, right? Or partially hot, partially cold. We have a couple major cities, and uh, these exports here might give you some suggestions of what culture there is like. But let's start to ask this question. We have the major theme of this planet is that everyone, a billion and a half people in Twi'lek, live in this strip of light between the hot and the cold sides. That means that, uh, well, let's ask, what does that mean? How is that, what kind of conflicts might that cause? How is this going to affect the planet in terms of Society, technology, and trade. Feel free to weigh in on the chats. Nacho says, territory in the temperate strip is precious. Yes, exactly. Property values are going to be very high in the middle, like in that perfect gold Goldilocks zone. That's what I was thinking. That's the term. The Goldilocks zone is the one where it's not too hot, not too cold. It's right in the middle, perfectly habitable. And yeah, that's going to be the center of a lot of conflict in terms of who gets the best land, who gets the best spot. And it's going to be more valuable 
It's going to be uh, considered, it's going to be more heavily guarded, and it's going to be defended quite vigorously by those who manage to get the best spots of land. Michelle says, conflict over water, land, and resources. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to have a lot of conflict in a hot, arid planet where we only have a small strip to live on. We're going to be competing for resources because we're all kind of being crammed into this area. And it's going to force people to, if they want to, um, uh, venture out into the wilderness to find more resources, they have to go out into extremely hostile conditions. So it may be that we need to, if we need more water, we may need to send an expedition out to the cold part of the planet to m dig up a bunch of ice bring it back to the middle, melt it down. That could be a whole job in that world, is people who retrieve and harvest ice, right? We have one comment from Dan saying, no orbit means one side boils and the other's dark and frozen. Yeah, exactly, that's true. So on one half, maybe that's where we could put all the solar panels. And on the other half, that's where we might put all of our sort of, um, uh, what do we call it, hydro th or hydropower, if we have like, you know, freezing cold rivers that aren't yet frozen. Or maybe in the strip, there's some running water that we could use um, to some extent. We have another comment. Vichikita says, wars between different clans. Yep, definitely. The different clans also probably having to either be based in that strip of light in the Goldilocks zone between the two extremes or clans that are based in orbits around the planet and that are fighting for control of the surface. Meaning that we might kind of want to out... Because the habitable land is so precious and rare, we might want to sort of outsource a little bit of the fighting that we're going to be doing to the to orbit so that we avoid ruining too much of that precious real estate. Natra says, some cultures adapt to living on the ice or darkness or in hotter regions. Yeah, there might be real, um, real hardy, brave groups that go out and find a way to adapt and live in the hot or cold regions that might form totally new divergent cultures from the culture that exists in the middle, right? Because how could the culture be the same when you're forced to live in such completely different very hazardous and dangerous conditions so that you're going to be able to probably find scattered clans in both the hot and the cold sides of vastly different cultures that have no relation maybe even don't even speak the same language as those in the middle um another comment overpopulation of habitable territory yep that's another problem so we're going to start to force the poor people out to the edges and the rich people are going to start buying up all the stuff in the middle there's just going to be too many people at some point it's going to lead to Fighting, trade wars, inequality, wealth inequality, distribution problems. Uh, we have a comment. Slavery. Yeah, we do have the export of slaves as the major exports, which maybe could... I'm not actually sure if that's a direct result of the conditions of the planet, but let's ask ourselves, how might it be part of the conditions of the planet? Why might they use slavery on a planet like this? Michelle says because of overpopulation. Yeah, maybe it's that they had too many people, so they're forced to use this extreme stratification and wealth inequality to create a caste system with whoever's on the bottom is going to be serving as the slaves, right? Because they don't even get the good houses to live in. They don't get the good atmosphere. They, they have to live in the worst conditions. Well, if we stratify society that much and somebody ends up on the bottom, I could see how slavery might evolve from that. Nacho mentions satellites could reflect sunlight to the ice or dark side. Yeah, that could be cool. Maybe there's a whole business in just hiring a satellite to escort your expedition through the Arctic half of the planet, right? We have the, the satellite operator who charges a fee to just reflect light down on you and keep your party warm as you go through the frigid cold regions. That would be pretty cool. Or maybe they have satellites that are meant to warm up a certain region to get it ready for habitation. Maybe we need to melt all the ice in one region before we can build a settlement there, things like that. Uh, another comment, a centralized government for the entire habitable region. Yeah, that does seem like what they would, like the, um, the a lot of the time in Star Wars worlds, also we are kind of looking at planetary governments rather than splitting that government into small, like smaller subdivisions than that. So in, in Star Wars, yeah, I could definitely see a government for that central strip kind of standing in for the control of the planet writ large. Um, whereas in real life, we would probably split it into different regions that are controlled by different sort of you know state level or you know we have federal control with a sort of state level control underneath that in space monarchy terms it might be we have a kingdom and we have several dukes beneath the king and underneath every duke we have several counts it might have be it might be broken up like that i'm not sure if they have a monarchy or what they have but it says here they have clan assembly and right left government which uh not sure how those work but in any case um a lot of the time in star wars world planets are all run by one government but in this one uh, and, and I was going to say, and in this one, I could easily imagine that to be the case. 
Um, or if we were designing this on our own, we could say the central strip is split up into like, maybe there's like five segments of that ring and each one is controlled by a different duke. Nacho also suggests maybe Goldilocks and her inhabitants clash with other species that can only live in the ice or hot regions. Yeah, maybe there's hostile races of aliens um, that are intending to wage war on those in the middle, and that, that would sort of create more solidarity with the middle dwellers who sort of see everyone else as their enemy. Okay, let's uh, proceed and look a little bit at species and uh, different alien races that we might include in our worlds. So species are really complex, more so than you can probably convincingly portray in a movie or one episode of TV. We're not going to be able to dig that deep on any one species in a movie or one episode of a show. So this is largely concerned for books, comic books, role-playing games, video games, and stuff like this, where we just have the ability to explore the uniqueness and eccentricities and interactions of these creatures on a longer longer scale than just an hour of movie, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's why we have such a bigger more developed roster of aliens in things like Mass Effect and Star Wars than we do in something like, I don't know, The Fifth Element, which has like two different types of aliens and we barely learn much about them. Um, so that's just uh, something to keep in mind is that in books we can delve so much deeper into what makes these different creatures tick, how they work, how their societies function, biology, physiology, culture, language, all these things, and we don't have that much time in movies and shows. So, the simplest explanation of a species usually, or the simplest example of one, can be broken down to one physical trait and one cultural trait. So, Kro let's start with Krogans, for instance. We all know Krogans. They're kind of, uh, <laughs> we all know Krogans. If you play Mass Effect, you know Krogans. They are huge frog dudes who are very warlike. They're sort of like orcs or Klingons in that way. How can we ensure that our species are distinct and realistic while avoiding this Planet of Hats trope? Let me explain the, start by explaining Planet of Hats. So, Planet of Hats is sort of saying... It's a shallow world building. It's a pejorative term that describes shallow world building. And it refers to the idea that, well, everybody from this planet wears a blue hat. And everybody from that planet wears a green hat. And, you know, that's enough to distinguish them. That's like saying every Krogan is a frog-like guy who likes war. And every elf uh, is a hunter who shoots a bow and arrow. And every dwarf is a miner and a craftsman. And, you know, these things that are just a hat that they wear, right? It's just a simple surface-level description of that person. To avoid this we can find ways that your characters maybe uh, embody some elements of the stereotypes and, and popular conceptions of their species and some ways that they rebel against those and some ways that your characters kind of don't match that that popular conception of what that species is like. So, And, and obviously their own picture of themselves, their own self-reflection is going to dive deeply into this question of like am i a proper member of my species or not i think um, like a billion star trek episodes are about does spock feel more like a human or more like a vulcan and how does he find his way between those two how does he find how does he forge his own path as a half vulcan right um so this is a uh something to consider like i mean we we can we in star trek we see all kinds of examples of vulcans who fit the stereotype some who deliberately defy the stereotype and some who um, may have never even heard of this stereotype. Maybe they're a Vulcan, but they're raised on some different planet entirely. They don't have any knowledge of their home culture. So it's the same way that you make different cultures feel diverse and realistic in real life. Just because you have an Italian, you do two Italian characters, doesn't mean that both of them really like making pasta and playing the accordion. And, um, you know, I don't know what else, uh, Italian stereotype, riding a Vespa by a canal. Like, not every single Italian character is going to do all of those things. They both might like pasta, and they, can't, they may not deny that, but it could be that one of them uh, is allergic to pasta. Or maybe uh, you could have a character that um, uh, he was born Italian but was raised in France and doesn't identify as an Italian at all but still might have the accent something like that where we can like find different ways that your characters can have a varied set of relationships to their heritage and to their home culture to their clan to their physiology to their species like if you have a, a like think of Hellboy for instance Hellboy is a good example of a demon character he's a demon I know this is fantasy not sci-fi but Hellboy is a demon that files off his horns with a big grinding like a big grinding device right so he's always got these two flat slabs on his forehead of cartilage or whatever they're his horns that he trims every single day to keep them from growing back that tells us a lot about that character right and although he might fit with some ideas of what a demon is he's red he's almost invincible he's immune to fire all these things like that right 
but he sort of rejects what he's supposed to be or do. And the fact that he cuts his horns off sort of tells us that he refuses to be all of what people expect him to be. And I think that's how you're going to avoid this Planet of Hats trope, is allowing your characters to accept, embrace, struggle with, and reject parts of what, like, if you if you, if you you do the work to build the sort of stereotypical example of that species, then you can start to think of ways that your characters can incorporate parts of that into themselves, fight against parts of that, or otherwise just, like Spock, find their own path in life. So not every character should, like, the way to avoid Planet of Hats is don't make characters that all match that one single stereotype. Make sure they feel varied and diverse just as much as real people do. Let's see if we can name all these species on here. We have Bothan, Protocol Droid, Duro. Um, do I know what this one is called? I forget what these. Gran, I think it's Gran. Human, Ithorian, Mon Calamari, and Celestin. That's a very tall Celestin, though. I don't think these are to scale. Normally, Celestins are about half this height. Um, and let's look at uh, a couple more. So we have Mass Effect creatures here. Asari, Solarians, Turians, Krogans, Volus, Corian, Geth, Hanar, and lastly, humans. And I actually really like this way that we kind of fight the stereotypes and trends in Mass Effect by challenging assumptions. So we can challenge assumptions about these different creatures and entities to craft these story seeds. Let's look at our first assumption that Mass Effect throws out the window. Here's the assumption. Humans are well integrated to the galaxy and either dominant or equally respected by all races. Their federations and trade groups essentially run the galaxy and have for a long time. How can we throw that out the window and what would the universe be like if this wasn't true? You don't have to use Mass Effect. If you don't, aren't familiar with Mass Effect, you don't have to tell us how they do it. Just tell us maybe how you would do it. Imagine that humans are brand new to the galaxy. They're just meeting all the aliens. What are some stories that could come with that or how does that lead to different story ideas? Michelle says humans might have little power. Yep, definitely. Either little political power, little warfare power compared to the other species. We're sort of the new kid on the block. Meep says humans were like the last to find Mass Effect fields. Yeah, so we're sort of considered inferior by a lot of the galaxy. We seem kind of dumb to them because we've taken so long to achieve hyperspeed travel or any of the technology they've had for a long time, right? We seem sort of primitive to them. We've seen as the children to the galaxy. That's a good point, Meep. We have a hand raised from Vichikita. Go ahead if you have a question or comment. Yes, kind of that scenario reminds me to a new movie that Pixar is gonna get out, Elio, and also reminds me of Lilo and Stitch. They are both like different, in which in Elio, that's kind of like they are looking for the we finally made contact with aliens and they already have this like society formed and they are looking for the like leader of the humans and they think this kid is a leader of the humans they most likely don't know how a human looks like so they are gonna say like anyone who proclaims themselves to be a grown-up human they might believe him and that. in Lilo and Stitch, it is like we're seen like nothing more than a little thing that exists in the planet that's not even worth like worrying about. They were more worried about the mosquitoes than the humans. Right. Yeah, I I, I really like the um the thing you just mentioned a second ago where uh, they it's sort of the trope where the first person the aliens meet, they just assume is like the king of Earth or whatever. So they, they, they assume that that person gets to make decisions for Earth and is speaking on behalf of Earth, maybe because they come from a collectivist culture where any single member of... like I, I just like it in sci-fi stories when aliens assume that humans will behave like they do. And therefore, we can sort of learn things about humanity by those assumptions that the aliens make. Um, for instance, I don't know, you have a, let's say you have a, an alien culture that goes to war with Earth, but then Earth starts losing, so the aliens decide to pull back and give us a chance. And we're like, why are you guys doing that? And they're like, oh, we thought you were doing that too. We thought that fair warfare was always like part of how you do war, right? And that might just raise certain questions with us, like why do we do things the way that we do? I really like how humans interacting with aliens in stories often turns the camera back on us, and it makes us sort of forces us to justify how we do things and how we live our lives. 
Also, another thing that this is not like any movie related, but it's like a thing I like to explore. It's like in a planet, there's an type of intelligent creatures, most likely. Not only one species of intelligent people, there could be humanoids or not humanoids. But they all can talk and comprehend each other. And in this case, since humans are like the only talking species in Earth, they wouldn't understand that. So you enslave other creatures from your world that are your equals, like dogs and things like that. They wouldn't understand the concept of having a, a pet. Right. Yeah, or having any ownership of any other living thing that might be seen as like a war crime to them or might be seen as reason enough to destroy Earth, right? Or even reason enough for like, if Earth is trying to become part of this like galactic union or something to not let them be part of it because they find them like horrible people. Sure, yeah, if humans have notably more barbaric practices than the rest of the galaxy does, then maybe they are not allowed into the galactic community. I love that idea. How embarrassing would that be? We get kicked out and no humans get to be part of the galactic federation or whatever. That'd be so embarrassing. Thank you for these ideas. You're welcome. Meep says, I like how in the Mass Effect universe, all characters, I think, have translators to help them understand each other. In Star Wars, in Star Wars, English is considered basic since that's the most commonly spoken. Yeah, basic is just the galactic basic, as it's sometimes known as just like whatever language you're watching the, spe the series in, basically. Not necessarily English, but for us, because we are English speakers, then it is English. But watch it in another country, well, basic becomes whatever language that is. Sometimes that's called common in uh, more fan... I guess... Basic is a is a pretty or galactic basic is a pretty standardized sci fi term as far as I know. Common is more like fantasy how they describe it the the common tongue is what they usually call it. Okay, let's um look at some more assumptions we can challenge. So how about this one? Aliens are invading the Earth to take its resources to limit its power or otherwise for dastardly and sinister reasons that benefit them and them alone. Let's challenge that assumption come up with you don't have i know i have the mass effect creatures up here you don't have to use them in your explanation but let's answer this question of what happens when we challenge this assumption what happens if this is no longer true what could the alien invasion be about meep is raising a hand go ahead meep i know you said we didn't have to use the mass effect example but the reapers were the first thing that jumped into my mind when i saw the words invasion and if i'm trying to remember correctly i believe their whole thing was the reapers were trying to wipe out organic not a wipe out organic life but they would basically like wipe out and then partially assimilate whatever organic life was around during that time period as a way of i think it was like preventing them from event pre either preventing them from destroying synthetics or from synthetics destroying them I, it's been so long and i i had a hard time getting to the third one but something to that effect i think was partially what the reavers were trying to do they came every fifty thousand years and just kind of ravaged the place yeah i'm reading the wiki article now so part of a scheme to harvest the galaxy's sentient life in a repeating cycle of purges that has continued relentlessly for countless millennia okay so they're like an like a they're like apocalypse aliens they show up every yeah. certain amount of time and they sort of reset everything back to zero. Is that right? Yeah. That is cool. So I guess um, in that case, their intentions are not necessarily sinister by their definition, right? Hmm. Or they may not even have that concept of it's bad to kill things. They might not even really have that idea at all. So yeah, in that case, we could see an alien invasion that's happening not because they want to take anything from us or because they want to steal our resources or impregnate our dogs or whatever, you know, probe our cows or whatever. They want to help the galaxy at large by resetting everything back to zero. What are some other reasons? You can stay on me, but what are some, some other reasons aliens might invade that are non-imperialistic? For the sake of, I don't know if this one counts, but I was also thinking of Brainiac 
Brainiac's whole thing was he had a penchant for knowledge, so he would assimilate cities, planets, lands, governments, and sometimes even just entire societies because he just wanted to keep that knowledge in his database. But I feel like that kind of is the general assumption because it is done for a benefit, but it's not more so I want to destroy your planet. It's more so I want to conserve what your planet is because I want to study it because that knowledge fascinates me. Is there a reason that he has to, like, take it over to study it? He doesn't take it over. He just literally takes it. Like, I believe Brainiac, I don't know how he does it, but, like, he'll basically just, like, kind of, I don't want to say supplant himself, but he just basically, like, can arrive on a planet, he has his forces, they effectively, like, kind of create this sort of field around, like, um a specific location and then it gets assimilated into his ship where he can then access it almost like a little hologram and just sort of study it. It's just, it's just his manner of doing things. If I recall correctly. Okay. Yeah. It seems like according to his wiki, at least he shrinks down and he steals whole cities. Yeah. Okay. So he's like trying to put them in little Petri dishes so he can poke around and study them in his lab. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That could be another good reason for sci-fi. It's to, study us and to gain knowledge i guess ultimately does he he probably sees that as a good reason right or a good cause i think it's i think it's a slightly selfish endeavor like he does it for himself because i don't know that he shares it with anyone i believe he mostly as far as i can recall and what does he think he's going to do with all that knowledge though he must think he's the best custodian of that knowledge at the least right i believe so yes Okay, so maybe he find, he's, he's like, he, yeah, he's like, I find this fascinating and I want to learn more about it. Like, I think it's it's more so like a selfish desire for knowledge, but the way he approaches it is very kind of scholarly in his mannerisms. Okay, so he's like an evil academic almost, or an evil, um, yeah. who, uh, he's, he's like obsessed with knowledge, wants to hoard the knowledge for himself. I wonder what he plans to do with it. It probably depends on the story, but um, yeah. Look how long this article is on him. Good. Yeah, God. he's a, he's a, he's been he has been in Superman's Rogue Gallery for a good long while. So he's one of he's like a I think a Silver Age, if not earlier, supervillain. This is just a shockingly so, detailed article. Oh yeah. Wow. My knowledge of him comes my knowledge of him comes from a game series called called Injustice. That's how I even learned about the guy. He's from 1958, according to Wiki. Okay. So he's been around quite a while. Mm -hmm. All right, that's some interesting stuff. So yeah, in, in invading Earth for knowledge as opposed to resources, or, or maybe he even sees knowledge as a kind of resource. But in order to gain the knowledge he wants, he has to Carmen San Diego, all of New York City or whatever, and stick it in a jar and put it on his shelf. Or like another cool idea could be like, um, I'd like experimented with this at one point in a, in a so a little fan fiction i won't go into it but basically the idea was um there were inhabitants on the planet before us for whatever reason they left and then they come back and they're just like what are you doing here this is our territory <laughs> have, you see, have you seen uh, battlestar galactica i have not oh well i won't spoil it then but that idea is eventually touched upon is all i will say the well oh. actually this isn't even a spoiler the characters are, are humans that are looking for earth that's like the premise of the whole show oh they're in a different galaxy they create a race of robots that rebels against them and now the only survivors of earth are, are not of earth the only human survivors are all in one big fleet of ships together going through space trying to find this legend of this place called earth which humans that, were supposed to have lived on a long time ago that sounds almost like it sounds very fam similar to the quarians I wouldn't have guessed that that's where that idea would have come from. Oh yeah, that's the way they wear their suits, right? Because they're not on their home planet and they can't live in the atmosphere of. Because they'll 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 fall ill other than unless they go to their own home planet, but they can't because it was annihilated by the Geth. Right. Um, mm. The what are they called? Keldor in Star Wars are a little bit similar. I think they they are able to take off their masks on their home world, but most of the time they're wearing like breathing devices. The the character on the Jedi Council, Plo Koon, is one of these guys. Oh, yes, yes. The yellow guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you for the questions and comments. I like these ideas of just non-standard alien invasions or different rationale or reasons behind them because they allow us to challenge what the audience expects, but also just do some brainstorming on like 
uh, different, it, like part of the fun of sci-fi is thinking of different reasons why these things might, might be happening, not just thinking of what's a different type of flying saucer we could use. It's like, what are some new and fascinating reasons the flying saucers could be here? And what are what what could that unlock in human nature? What are some stories that that could just create that we haven't seen before? I see. Well, thank you I for allowing uh, me to participate on the stage. Oh, sure, sure. Thanks for coming up. I always really like when there's human collaborators with the aliens. You don't see that very much, but um, in a story where the aliens are doing some kind of not entirely selfish and sinister evil conquest, then it kind of makes a lot of sense that there would be some humans that were on the alien side. There's a pretty fun strategy game called Terra Invicta, in which um, you play as one of like seven or eight different factions on an Earth, a modern day Earth where aliens land, and we don't know what they want yet, but you have to kind of navigate figuring out what they want and then accomplishing your, factor, your faction's goal despite not knowing what the aliens are capable of because they're sort of randomized every game. And you have different factions. One of the factions wants to make friends with them and appease them. One of the factions wants to annihilate them. One of the factions wants to find a way to leave Earth and escape from them. One of the factions... So you see, like, we can see all these different interesting perspectives on the aliens' arrival that just lead to multi more dynamic and multifaceted scenarios than the standard, oh, they showed up with saucers to blow everything up. Okay, let's look at societies and civilizations. Let me check these comments really quick, though. Vichikita says, Humans might unknowingly have been creating a world for another society of aliens to inhabit Earth. That's a cool idea. Michelle says, Ocean water to convert clean H2O and sand to create electronics, like we're a galactic truck stop. Nitrogen and heat, we could trade for technology. Okay, all very cool ideas, definitely. Let's um, look at societies and civilizations. We have about 25 minutes left. So we should be thinking what conflicts do the circumstances of my planet and also the civilization itself create? And if your world works the exact same way as Earth, we are just going to ask the question, why does your story take place on another world at all? What social features might arise as a result of different living conditions on different planets? For instance, we can start with barren desert worlds. It might lead to a mining colony with a civilization existing only in tiny, heavily fortified dome cities so that they can avoid the worst of the desert storms that whip through and destroy everything, right? Let's think of a different class of world. We can go back to our types of planets if you guys want to. And let's come up with a new society and civilization based on the features of that world. Let's get a volunteer. Michelle. I've invited Michelle to the stage. You'll have to click the accept button. Okay, we can get if Michelle's not able to accept, we can get another volunteer. Anyone else? Jack. Hello, can you hear us okay? Or hear me okay, I should say. Your mic is on mute, just so you know. How about a water, wor water world with a few scattered islands? Great. Okay, we'll start with island planets. So um, okay. let's remind ourselves what the major features of the water planet are going to be. This is going to be more than eight, or the island planet. It's going to be around 80% uh, surface water. We are so largely submerged, meaning microcontinents, island chains, shallow and warm, um, resulting in tropical climate and advanced underwater ecosystems. All right, now let's ask some questions about what life would be like on a planet like that so you can start okay. or you can, we can just start wherever you want or we can jump to these specific categories like we could start with class want me to go or do you want someone oh, else no, to yeah go? I'll, no all you you're, you're the volunteer so why don't we start with class want to tell us what do you think would be some interesting ways that we that the class division would work on an island planet like this well to start with we assume that since most of the planet's resources are in the water that population is going to be spending a lot of time at sea thus sea the sea would probably define most things so i imagine that wealth would be defined by owning assets that can go into the sea such as ships sure and um 
They're also, since we're, this is sci-fi, not fantasy, so unless they've completely, like, devolved after, like, losing contact, they'll probably be, and this is, like, my idea is that there's a human colonist presence on the surface, but that there's an alien species on, in the water, and they don't discover them until a while later. Sure. That could be cool. So there's natives. This is like Avatar a little bit, right? Where there's like a native bit, alien species, yeah. the humans show oh, up. Go ahead. Amongst the humans, I figure there's going to be people who fish and who fish, mine, do whatever you need to do in the water. And then there's going to be people who work in the factories and executives and people who like do, you know, technical stuff on land. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the colony's very dependent on presence on like people from away, like people in the colony themselves are probably working for i mean we're assuming earth's still out there unless it's been completely wiped out right so they're probably going to be working for someone say a ship comes along to take the processed resources somewhere else right good point point. and in terms fact of class there might not even be enough land for really crazy resource intensive manufacturing so they might have to do stuff either in space or on a moon or something that's a good point yeah the the land is going to be so limited and so kind of swampy and uh flooded that uh, or like you know there's just not going to be too much of it to utilize to make solid structures so we may have to have floating cities we may need to have floating buildings or if, or otherwise just like ships that we can land and use as per more permanent structures maybe they're anchored in place let's look at religion So you can imagine either that this is going to be a human colony, or you can think of maybe the aliens on who call this planet home. What are some what are some features that you can imagine that their religion might touch on? Mm, probably ocean life. Sure. Both of them, if a new religion arises amongst the colonists, though. If colonists, I always imagine that the Earth eventually becomes a sort of object of reverence. Yeah, that's a good point. So at, at a certain point, you may have some characters that either are clinging to Earth religions or who are um, kind of, uh, if if they don't, if they haven't adopted the local religion, maybe they're creating localized offshoots or sects of older, like maybe they come, maybe 100 years back, the colonists were Christian, but by now they're Christian slash whatever the local religion is, right? That's kind of how folk beliefs get incorporated into larger religions when they go into new areas. We could see some good examples of that. One thing I tend to remember is that Muslims would probably pray towards Mecca still, so they'd have to pray towards Earth, and eventually that might spread towards everything else. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like Earth is sort of like... Oh, could they even see... Oh, yeah, you'd have to get like a telescope or something. Yeah, there's a... Um... Earth. The game, The Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay, actually touched on this exact idea, so I'm glad you brought it up, weirdly. But um, there's a prison colony in that game. There's only prison colonies in that game. But uh, there, since there are some several Muslim characters that are in the prison, there's, like, an announcement that comes on, over the PA system every, like, I don't know, once a day or whatever, and it's like, Mecca is now located at these coordinates. And so every day they have to kind of relocate which direction they're facing when they pray. Cool, right? You don't see details like that in video games very much. Let's think language. Oh, um, I honestly don't think language would, well, it might change a bit, but from Earth, just because they're far away, my original thinking was that radio would prevent linguistic divergence, but... In most scenarios, I'm going to assume that interstellar communication is much harder than interplanetary communication, so maybe languages would diverge a bit. Yeah. Also, if we imagine you're saying there's a native alien aquatic species, if they are speaking aloud, then they must be doing so in such a way that you can do underwater, right? Yeah. I mean, I'd have to research how creatures underwater speak. Maybe like dolphins do? Yeah, maybe they have a, a, a language that's based on... Speech. Yeah, maybe they have a language that's more like based on clicks and whistles and things like that, rather than art super articulate words, like with... Um, yeah. Maybe it has to be high-pitched and almost... Yeah, think of like the sounds that ocean creatures make, whales, dolphins. Maybe their language is a little bit like that. Oh, God, can you imagine people start using slang terms from the alien speech in their day-to-day -day talk? So they'll, they'll be like, that guy was such a... 
I, I can't even do it. Um, I try to do a dolphin sound, but like they they start incorporating aspects of the local language into English, right? Yeah. So that's always really cool to see, and and depending on how people view the aliens, you then we can go back to class and we can say like, oh well, low class people use all that gutter talk or whatever, right? They they're gonna we call them bubble speakers or some, we have some made up like almost like a uh, prejudice term towards people who. Uh, or t- towards anyone who sympathizes with or shares any aspects of alien culture. Oh, thing you have to... Well, I'm not sure that if association with the aliens would immediately make one dirty, because your first occupation is going to be stuff that has to do with the sea, right? That's mm. going to be what the majority of the population works in. Maybe it's not so much dirty so much as, like, traitor if they fight a lot. Sure, yeah. It depends on their specific relationship with the natives, definitely. Um, but in this case, I think we're going to really rely on them if, or we're going to need their help, or at least not to be fighting with them if you want the colony to thrive. Oh, yeah, if anything, there's probably going to be classes in school on this stuff. That'd be cool. Yeah, people starting to spend more time underwater would be neat. Watching humans that grow up mostly underwater would be cool. How about economics or resources? Well, as I said, most wealth would probably be related to the sea, either fishing sea mining um i don't know other stuff that goes with the ocean and the land that exists so i'm thinking there would still be some islands and island continents that you can settle would more be more like a base for things to go out in the sea that's a good idea michelle has mentioned in the comments seawater or saltwater would be common but freshwater might be rare so maybe a freshwater based currency that could be cool maybe jars or right in or act they might have to just manufacture all their water use like all their water from a desalinization plants Mm -hmm. because if you don't have any really big continents you're not going to have a lot of a lot of water for a civilization to use like you may have some like puddles and lakes but i imagine a large human presence especially one that has industry and such would use that up pretty quickly yeah for sure um And in terms of resources, maybe geothermal heat would be important to locate as well. So areas underwater that we can tap into to sort of derive geothermal power from. Um, Yeah, 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 that's a good idea. Or tidal power, which is using tides and ocean currents to move turbines and stuff like that. So I imagine that we're going to be deriving most of our power from that, or perhaps from surface-level wind farms. So like those those floating windmills that they have in big groups on the surface or maybe ships covered in those that could be kind of cool i think that's where we'll get a lot of power and i think if you meant you're mentioning these if fresh water is going to be our source of currency we're going to have to really heavily guard those desalinization plants too right that's going to have be covered in sentry guns and stuff i i guess fresh water could like back the currency like gold backs a currency but i mean how would you pay for like something with fresh water would you like get a cup and like go off and buy a car with that probably units or pro- it would probably be maybe a digital currency that you there'd be like yeah like you said like a freshwater standard so you use like digital tokens and then you go to the plant and you can exchange your tokens for jar not jars or i, I guess you put them in tubes or something or maybe it pumps it directly to your dwelling or your your house or something like that I think that would probably make more sense than because you can't. It would be tough to carry around, you know, like jugs of water underwater. Last question: Art and entertainment. Uh, I don't have anything off the top of my head. Someone else, maybe someone else wants to take over. <laughs> okay, we could. You've done everything else. I think you, we can think of something. What if I just give you an okay. idea? But of course, uh, p- p- folks can still weigh in in the, in the text comments. Okay, if they want something. To. Um, Go ahead. Let's see. Um, maybe. Um, our sports are obviously going to be big. Sure. Racing, boat racing, sailing. What else? I imagine that even if it's not big for the colonists, that if they have any contact with the Earth other human colonies nature documentaries and stuff like that just showing off planet life would be a big industry like even if they themselves don't use it it would be like an entertainment industry you know sure they could export that 
um, and just sort of like teach people about their planet, show the galaxy what their world is like. Maybe tourism, I guess, is what you're sort of touching on, right? Tourism. Yeah, if there's yeah, if they if there's enough fast is faster than light travel for tourism, though I imagine more like opposite actually that people can't afford to go there as tourists, so films are a big deal. That could be, yep, yeah, for sure. Um, How about sorry if about I don't film? pronounce your name right, but Vichikita uh, said water kind of rituals of passage, and I really like that one. Sure. Can you give an example? I don't know, like I mean, obviously, when infants would be like, I guess, baptized in the ocean, then sure. after a, then basically at every stage of your life, you get a dunk in the ocean. How about in order to be an adult, you have to go kill a big sea monster? Okay. That would be scary. You have to. So, like, the, the bigger one you bring back when you turn eighteen or whatever, the more the bigger party you get. It's like the sweet sixteen. You go and you as deep as you can possibly go. You kill the biggest sea monster you can find, and that's like a test of manhood or adulthood. Okay. We could also do what? What else? How else do people entertain themselves in the ocean today? Um, Michelle mentioned water polo or synchronized swimming. Sure. Okay, we could do those. Swimming is obviously going to be a big part of life here. We have boat races. We have. Um, uh, the different sports that we could create that are entirely underwater or on the surface of the water you like what's that game that they play in final fantasy 10 blitzball where it's in like a giant orb of water um let's see anything else deep diving contest yeah maybe the deeper that we can explore um we can find more resources down there so the idea of exploring the oceans becomes a big part of the culture cave exploration oh god that sounds terrifying not like entertainment to me but yeah you could definitely explore underwater caves looking for treasure sunken treasure shipwrecks destroyed ships crashed ships i mean if alien if alien societies have been visiting this planet for a long time just imagine what kind of stuff is under the waves out there what kind of buried treasure you could get from the wrecks there's a lot of cool stories there we haven't seen a lot of sort of sci-fi based high seas adventures um, there's one I actually know of. It's called, uh, I actually forget what it's called, but it's like this anime that's set on Mars that's been terraformed and is water-based. Whoa. I think someone described it as, like, the one mecha anime that doesn't crib from Evangelion. Okay. Hang on, that I can actually cool. go down to my basement and get the DVD if anyone wants to know what it's called. Yeah, feel free to drop it in the chat and let us know. Okay. Thanks a lot for volunteering. We're down to our last 10 minutes. Um, we are pretty much, I mean, I could go more into society place names and designing worlds and things, but I think I want to maybe just open for questions. I had a bunch of prompts as well. Let's open for questions. So uh, anything that we've talked about today, or maybe you guys have a question about some sci-fi principle that you yourself are working on or practicing or, you know, practicing getting better at, or maybe you have questions about, um, let's, open the floor to any and all topics about sci-fi world building. All right, looks like we have a raised hand. Go ahead, Vichikita. In a story I'm doing, I have like sci-fi elements even though it's like fantasy mainly, but I have a, like a sci-fi society that's based like in mainly nature science, like using renewable energy. And I didn't know exactly how to like make it believable because there's only some types of like nature science we use right now that's like the water gener uh, technological generators the solar panels and windmills and that's like it but I imagined it like a human like world even though this is like more populated by forest more than being 
like it doesn't have big mountains or anything like that it's more like forest based and there's like plains in the middle okay so i don't know how flat it would work yes i see a bit flat okay so how how can i help or what's what's your question how i can make it so that because i normally like the water base this needs some height for it to work but in a planet that's like a little bit flat i don't know if it would work oh okay so you're you're just looking for scientific ideas for your people to uh, for your characters to use renewable energy sources yes it would be useful because i have like little ideas of how I could use that technology, but I don't have like day-to-day -day ideas for the solar punk concept. Hmm. Okay, well, I mean, if it's a forested planet and we're trying to, you're saying solar punk, meaning based on solar power, I suppose, or the technology uses a lot of solar power, then I think you're going to have to build the panels in the canopies of the trees or maybe find a way for the trees themselves to absorb sunlight and get energy from that or maybe your character is there a way that we can get energy from plants i wonder biofuels it's mentioned on this uh article's list of renewable energy sources so i mean your characters for one could just we could always just burn plants and vegetation for power that's not renewable really um except in the sense that we can plant new trees but that takes a long time for them to grow right so i'm not an expert on these topics maybe we have someone in the chat who knows more about renewable energy sources than me. But um, I think that you could still use wind power on a world like this, couldn't you? Uh, is there a reason they can't use windmills? Or did you say they were using that? Mm, they are using like solar panels, windmills, and I wasn't sure if they could use like nuclear power that's supposed to be like kind of non hurtful but i didn't want it to use it because solar punk is more based on in like but plant-based nature-based um technology hmm. and Weird. mostly it is like biotechnology in general the solar punk genre okay um well uh this is just called biomass energy when we are converting solid we're taking plant materials and turning them into electricity so i don't know the specifics of exactly how that works i don't think it always involves burning them a lot of the time i think it does but there are other ways to get energy from plants i am not the person to ask about this but i i've just looked up a couple articles and this always seems to come up we have biomass and then also there's geothermal so your characters could also get power from the earth if they dig if they tap into um, the uh, the the heat or volcanic fissures in the ground, they might be able to get power that way. Um, and I think that's fully renewable. Yes, and I kind of wanted to make some fantasy with it because the world is mainly we're going to see the fantasy part. But I, there's a lot of parts that are going to be shown in regards to the more sci-fi world. And part of it that I'm kind of like using really soft sci-fi for is they want to use like these gods or godly creatures that exist that have like a connection with the earth and can like harness power and have like magic to okay. be like renewable sources of energy so that's essentially biomass but in a it's a much more sinister twisted version of that right it's using a living entity as the source of the of the biomass energy so um yeah i could see how that might just be an extension of this type of technology right where if we're normally using organic material to create power this is just kind of the next step of that it's like the very dark next step of that process so i think that works well 
so yeah, just to as just to answer your question, I would look into both geothermal and biomass as your character's main forms of energy on a planet like this. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for the question. I think we have time for one more question. And looks like um, Jack has given us the anime he was talking about, which is called Kenron Butosai, The Mars Daybreak. Thank you for that. Looks like, looks like we have our last question from Dan. No, it's more about, it's like, oh, I'm not even sure how to word my question. I guess you were talking about the world building and how it should be more in the background instead of what the people, with what the characters are talking about. And I have to agree. So I just want to make sure people understand the world. How do you want to ensure that people are understanding the world going on and the actions of the characters in a way that it doesn't distract from the building of the characters as they deal with whatever issues characters deal with? Because even if it's in a fantasy world, characters still have human emotions and human heroes' journeys, whichever type, whichever uh, circle or path you, uh, you, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, I think so. So the key to doing this, and you're basically talking about exposition. How can we um, learn, how can the audience learn the key information about your world without slowing down the story or boring them? Um, and the answer is usually to find a way to do two things at once, if not more than two, but two is usually adequate, um, meaning that when your scene is accomplishing one task, it's, it's like a form of stage magic almost, right? Where we're distracting the audience with by waving this hand over here. And that's kind of like the main meat of the scene. And then the other thing going on might be some form of exposition that we aren't really even paying attention to, right? So this might be something as simple as you have a character that's having a phone conversation with their mom or whatever. They're like, mom, uh, you know, what, let, let's make our plans for Christmas. And in the meantime, our character is, uh, you know, using a, using the computer in their room or whatever. And we learn that, okay, in this world, com computers must clearly use... Uh, thought power brain power to do everything right and we see as they look up well how am i going to get to the place where we're going to spend christmas they use google maps with their brain like we sort of watch them use the technology to do something else and through them doing something else we learn how it works it's not a scene where we have to have the character sit down and say hey this is how this brain internet technology works we watch them use it to do something else so i think keeping your characters very active is always going to help here trying to do like combine moments of learning about the world with something else interesting going on will prevent your audience from being distracted or feeling like okay here it comes here's the big long explanation of the rules get your characters interacting with stuff um trying things out making plans living their lives and as you can like you can find scenes within there to layer in your technology or or sci-fi world building in whatever way that we are um it's the, the spoon of sugar that goes with the, the medicine or whatever. If you do it right, it shouldn't feel too boring or um, you shouldn't lose the audience. As long as they're being entertained by something, they'll accept a lot of information. I think that's what I was thinking, but I just wanted to be sure. Yeah, if that's what you're trying to do, then and if that's what you're, that's what you're doing in your work, chances are if you're aware of it, then you can use that technique. And... Um, uh, practice makes perfect. So the more that you do this, the more scenes like that than you write, the better you'll get at just making sure they feel like they're organic and they're flowing very well, and they don't feel like, okay, here's the lecture time, time to go to sleep. Great question. Thank you so much for asking. Thank you. We are wrapping up for today. Here's the upcoming classes. You can see them all here. Upcoming boot camps. They're going to be Fridays 6 to 8 for movies. We've learned to write a movie in 8 weeks. We have pilots Sundays 10 to noon. And we have novels Saturdays 12 to 2. These are all in Pacific time. And the dates are right there on the screen. I'll leave this up for a minute. And make sure to come by our AMA QA class with Max Perry, WGA writer Max Perry, um, 12 to 2 on Saturday, July 15th. Plenty to do on WordCamp, lots of activities, over 100 hours of classes per month between ScriptCamp and WordCamp, so we hope to see you guys soon at your next class, workshop, or event. Thanks so much for coming by.